a brand new episode of Hello, I'm Listening. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. Let me just just one thing right away because I'm very excited. I'm so fucking excited. <laughs> no, but um, this episode is very special. It is. Because we have a professional on. I mean, we always have professionals on. No, I know, I know. I know. We, <laughs> oh, we always do. I mean, the the episode with um, Fitz Kohler. Yeah. Oh, man. That was uh, such a great episode. If you have not listened to it yet, you should. She's Definitely a, check it out. Yeah. It's great. She's super inspiring. Yeah, that was that was very cool. Um, but because we, you know, started as a relationship podcast, um, this guest that will follow. Um, yeah. How long can Voifey drag out the intro? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, before we go into the intro, uh, the, the, the intro, <laughs> we are doing the intro. <laughs> before we're going into the guest, obviously, um, I just want to quickly say we watched the that 90s show on Netflix. Oh, and that was a complete 180. I know, I know, but I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to put it in because um, if you have not seen that 70s show... Like Ashton Kutcher's and um, a lot of other actors, Big Break, Mila Kunis, Mila Kunis, obviously, yeah. and it's such a, I don't know, big part of my youth. Yeah, mine too. And um, I mean, obviously, you're coming from Wisconsin, so there's yeah. even more. And they're right to next to Milwaukee. They're based basically right. in Milwaukee. Yeah. So. And even yeah, so you can relate way more to that thing, but but. Um, yeah, and Netflix brought them back in that 90s show, and it's a very heartwarming little thing. It's, it's super nostalgic, yeah. and it's yeah. it's really nice. It's yeah. really nice. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a nice, feel-good, um, funny, laugh-out-loud thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what I think you were going to say before you took a 180 is that the professional, he said we have a professional on, but then you didn't say anything <laughs> <laughs> um, we have Laura Silverstein. Yeah. And she is a couples therapist. Of over 30, or almost 30 years. Um, and she is certified in Gottman Method. And she has two books. One of them is coming out soon. And she will talk about it. And also, um, just... You know, getting those little tips and little things you can do to improve your relationship. And even um, just the fact that she says, I don't want to go into that, but not, I don't, I'm not saying that. That's a spoiler. But oh my Should God. Should we print out the transcript right. and you can just rebuild it? <laughs> we just re <laughs> we, I'll be her, you be me. <laughs> No. Uh, yeah, no, let's just get into it. Okay. <laughs> so we are joined again by a very special guest today. Hello. 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 Great to be here. Uh, maybe you can just give us a little bit about you, a little who you are, what you do, where you are. Yeah, great. So thanks again. My name is Laura Silverstein, and I am located right outside of Philadelphia. And I am a couples therapist. I've been doing this for 30 years, so a very long time. <laughs> and I'm an author. I wrote a book called Love is an Action Verb. And I'm actually currently working on a workbook for couples to do together. And that's going to be coming out in the next month or so. Mm -hmm. oh, wow, that sounds super fascinating. 30 years. Uh, so um, one could say you have a lot of experience with that field. Um, obviously, I mean, you've written books. But um, what is it that keeps you in that field? What is it that, um, you know, keeps you engaged and, and interested in it? Oh, that's a great question. And I think I'm very lucky because not everybody loves their work. And I, mm -hmm. and I have that immense privilege that I look forward to work still. Because helping people fall in love or stay in love is a pretty extraordinary thing to be a part of. And I, I always say, you know, the people who are doing the hard work are the couples who come to my office. I sort of think of it as me setting the table for a potluck and then they come and I kind of am there to help make sure that things go smoothly. But they're the ones that are really putting themselves out there, being vulnerable 
And when people do the work and really commit to trying to make some changes, it's, it really does work and people can make small little tweaks that make an immense difference and feeling loved, feeling connected, feeling like their day-to-day -day life is just a little bit happier knowing you've got somebody that's really in your corner or feeling like mm -hmm. you're a team with somebody makes it easier to go out into the world and do difficult things because, you know, oh, somebody back home at least is rooting for me when I'm going into this, you know, scary job interview. Whereas when things aren't going well, we feel more lonely, we feel a little more self-critical. And so it's pretty, um, pretty exciting to be part of a process where, where people are feeling better and happier. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who, who can say that? You know, there's a lot of people that, that in their work, it's not necessarily about adding happiness. It's about decreasing pain. And I think that's why I chose this part of the field of therapy is, is to grow that positivity, as well as obviously there's a lot of conflict management and it's not yeah. all, what do they say? It's not all rainbows and unicorns, but mm -hmm. but overall you have two people who are in my office because they want to make changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you find that more people that come to you or more couples that come to you are coming to you as like their they've been struggling already for a really long time. Like, cause for us, we went to couples therapy as well for a while, but we did it more as like preventative. We wanted to learn how to communicate better. And we figured, you know, we're both from families of divorce. And for me, it was always like therapy seemed like last resort, but we yeah. decided to be more proactive about it. And I'm wondering if that is something that you see often or not so often that, it's people you guys coming are in as wonderful. proactive. You're like a couples therapist dream. <laughs> you know, it's like, I think that it's hard to do exactly what you're describing. I think the statistic is most couples wait seven years before they reach out for help, right? Oh, and, wow. And so it's, I'm always on this mission to help people a little bit earlier. And mm -hmm. I think the stigma of of therapy is going down, I but agree. it's yeah. also really expensive and it's inaccessible for many people. So mm -hmm. they try to do things on their own. And a lot of times it's hard to carve out the time, the money when things are going pretty well. And you just, you know, prevention is, is <laughs> I think that's true in pretty much many, many, you know, the health industry of uh, that we know that prevention is better than intervention, but it's still hard to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So I would say that I have the mix. I definitely have some people who are in your situation, but that's not the norm. I think the mm -hmm. norm is for people. I, I have to say too, that I have a lot. It's not uncommon for people to say, okay, Laura, you are our seventh couples therapist <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, wow. okay. because I'm certified because I've written books or whatever. They're kind of like, all right, we're coming to you. And if you can't help us, like we're done. Mm -hmm. So I feel that, that it would part of my mission now, I think at this point in my career is to reach people earlier in more accessible ways. And that's why I'm trying to do more podcast interviews and write these books so that you can get some of these tools for $15 and hopefully can practice them, sit down with your partner, do a workbook together and, and that you're less likely to get into bad habits at the front end that's gonna, that could have been preventable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you if you look at like your 30 years and and how did um, relationships change in that time, especially with like social media and easy access of, you know, maybe talking to someone else and maybe even starting a relationship over texting and, you know, all the apps that are out there. Have you noticed any any changes in, in that regard or even in like uh, the reasons why people come to you? Yeah, that is a great question. And I think that it's both. In many ways, the struggles that people are having today are the same as 10 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe people who preceded me in the field of just that general sense of I want to feel connected and I want to feel loved. Mm -hmm. 
And the main question, the main statement that people usually say for coming into couples therapy is we need help communicating better. Mm -hmm. And those dynamics, those interpersonal communication patterns, those are, have not changed. It's still criticism, self-defense, attack, defend patterns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One person shuts down and the other person wants to, to engage. Those are the things that I see. Everybody has different hairstyles, different clothes, but the, the, those things are the same. But when I think about what's changed, that's exciting to me because I definitely am seeing less shame about therapy in general. So yeah. I am seeing people earlier. I, I have... People who come in and say, you know, it used to be that they found me this really indirect, convoluted way because they didn't want to say to their neighbor, oh, do you have a couple therapist you recommend? And I love to say that that has just gotten better and better and better. And people are like, oh, yeah, you should try my couple therapist or like, <laughs> you know, there's this great anxiety yeah. person. And uh, so I think... I think we can thank social media for that. I'm on TikTok a lot and and I love it because it's normalizing things that everybody can relate to. And when you mm -hmm. see somebody yeah. else, especially if you see somebody famous saying that they went to a therapist and it was really helpful, then it might be a little bit easier for somebody who maybe was raised in a family where they were taught that that really you shouldn't talk about your feelings, that you know you should do this on your own, or if you mm -hmm. need therapy, things must be really bad. Like you might as well get divorced if you need couples therapy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You um, talked about like um, communication. We, co me coming from Austria and Danielle coming from the U.S. Um, and figuring out you know the language barrier at first, and then <laughs> also communication on two different languages and also arguing in two different languages. And wow. also a big thing for us was like the, 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 the overall sound of a language. Yeah. German is a very, can sound very, very direct, <laughs> can sound very direct and also uh -huh. harsh yeah. um, because of the pronunciation of different well, words. And also the way that it's translated one to one, like the right. way that they say something in German might If you translate it exactly to English, it might sound like it would never say it that way in English right, right. and vice versa. Right. It's the same so thing. So even like, yeah, right. Like having problems translating thoughts and, and even feelings and conveying them in a way where the other person doesn't feel like criticized or or attacked even. Mm -hmm. um, do you have like any any um, tips or any, any ways of maybe communicating um, things that you would need from a partner or even your feelings in a way where the other person doesn't feel like uh, criticized or attacked so they or get defensive? Or doesn't need to get defensive, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. right. Right, right. Absolutely. I think this is probably 80% of what we practice in my office and what I practice in my own marriage and what my husband, like we're both couple therapists, by the way, my husband. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So would you like to be a fly in that wall? Like, do you think, oh, they communicate perfectly? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, it's interesting, so interesting what you're saying about the challenge around having not speaking in the language that you grew up speaking. So then you have to translate internally before speaking mm -hmm. out loud, yeah, yeah. number one. Number two, there might be words that you use that aren't critical if you were to say it to someone else in your culture, but might land as critical to someone else. And so the the main advice I always give people is is to try to slow down a little bit before speaking out loud. Easier mm -hmm. said than done, okay? Because the way to not be critical, most people know the formula and I'll review it, but but it's not really that difficult in in uh, concept, but it's difficult in, in practice mm -hmm. because usually we feel critical when we're upset, not when we're nice and calm and feeling really generous and like we're going to use this really fluffy language. So so there's two parts of it. Number one is making sure that you're calm enough to bring up your request or thing that you're unhappy about. It's important to speak your truth, but I talk about speaking truth with kindness. 
And mm -hmm. if you're too upset to do that, don't try to plow through it and force yourself because it's going to come out with an edge anyway. Usually what I recommend is take a breather. Maybe that's a shower. Maybe you go for a walk around the block so that you can, you can let your heart rate come down, catch your breath, and then approach your partner and let them know what you're unhappy about. Mm hmm yeah. So that's the first step. And then the second step is what do you actually say? And so my formula is, is actually not mine. It's John Gottman's, who's the, the person who I've studied under. And it's, I feel blank. So it's, you know, I feel mm -hmm. frustrated. Yep. Not I feel like, not I feel mm -hmm. that, <laughs> not I feel you. Because all of those things are obviously not talking about your own personal emotions. Mm -hmm. So I feel feeling. And then about, then the fill in the blank after the, the about is the situation. I feel frustrated about how late we tend to leave when we're going somewhere. And then, then the third part is to come up with a request. And I'd really like to try to leave a little bit earlier or communicate about how much time, you know, when you're going to arrive so that I can plan accordingly. And mm -hmm. so what we know is that most of the times little kids learn the I statements. I feel this about this, but they don't often follow up with the request. They don't teach that in mm -hmm. middle school because if, mm -hmm. you, if, you if you finish with what you're asking for, then your partner has an opportunity to try to give you what you want. Yep. If you don't yeah. have a request, then, it just, then they're more, much more likely to get defensive and be like, there was traffic or I, you know, I'm really working on this versus, oh, okay, my partner wants me to text them when I'm leaving. Oh, wow, that's very concrete and I can do that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, totally. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically what we are trying to do and what we, I think, incorporated a lot mm -hmm. in our relationship. We're not perfect and we're obviously not doing it all the time, but we, we have been going from arguing a lot to almost arguing never or in a very or when constructive, we do, it's constructive way yeah, yeah like yeah where, where we actually talk and not you know get loud or, or frustrated or mm -hmm. defensive yeah that was a big point for us yeah i think it actually saved us when we we just finished building uh we remodeled the house <laughs> and we went through a <laughs> six-month period of <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> And we went into it thinking, okay, this is going to be a test on our relationship for sure, because there's going to be really stressful days and we have to see how well we do. And, you know, I think we maybe had like two bigger like blow ups of frustration. Mm -hmm. But in a six month period, I was like, I'm actually really impressed with it. Yeah. <laughs> we did pretty good. Yeah. But with that, though, there's another thing, um, because that happens a lot where, you know, you said the request you request something for the other person or um, where you try to give them constructive criticism where you say, mm -hmm. okay, maybe, you know, um, we could try this together or maybe you could help me with that in that regard. Um, and a big part of it is not getting defensive because um, I've seen it a lot and even talking to, you know, not uh, um, even friends or family members where you ask something or where you criticize them in a constructive way they immediately immediately get defensive and sure. and 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 get into this like um defensive mode where you they feel attacked but is there a way where maybe um even you i mean i don't know if that's even possible but uh, asking or even phrasing it in a way where people don't get defensive in a way or and then vice versa where maybe someone can answer in a way where they don't sound defensive sure that's that's a really important dance and the more that mm -hmm. both people are working on their 50 percent of this communication pattern the better it will go but it doesn't have to be that way so some of your listeners might have you know a boss at work or something who never uses this beautiful little soft startup where they ask for what they need and they're talking in first person so we do have to know how to do these skills even when our communication partner, and maybe our romantic partner, maybe it could be anybody, when the other person is not doing their part in mm -hmm. it. So mm -hmm. the thing about how to give constructive criticism 
the more that you can find a way to speak in first person instead of second mm -hmm. is less likely to make the person defensive. So mm -hmm. I'm confused is better than you're not making sense. Okay. Yeah. Or um, you're expecting too much of me or versus I'm really working hard to understand how to do this and I need some help. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's always an I statement, I statement. There's a lot of a value about just how much we're fighting against human nature with defensiveness because we're mammals. And when we feel attacked, we defend ourselves yeah. either by fight, flight, or, or freeze, which by the way, freeze is shutting down, playing dead. Mm -hmm. so, so we're fighting against biology, really. And so that defensiveness is a very, very normal experience and nobody can get rid of it entirely. Your goal in, in a relationship is not to never feel defensive or be defensive, but it is to catch yourself a little sooner and to take accountability. Mm -hmm. Find a kernel of truth in what you agree, agree with vis-a-vis -vis the criticism. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So that yeah. you probably don't agree with everything that you're being accused of, but maybe you can say, yeah, you know, I, I know that I've been running late. And if somebody told you you've been late every single day this, this week, you're like, oh my gosh, I know I was really late on Tuesday. And I recognize that that set everybody back and you guys were waiting for me and that's a huge problem. You don't focus on the Wednesday, Thursday and Friday that you were on time because mm -hmm. that's going to up the person's ante and trying to communicate to you what's important to them, which is they mm -hmm. want you to be more timely. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. As you're talking, I'm like thinking of all these examples of just like within our relationship when we do that, when, you know, the two of us, like one of us will say something that frustrated us or upset us. And the other person's like, well, I didn't do that on this day or this day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's something we can work on for sure. That's right. a good one. <laughs> like nobody ever always takes out the garbage and nobody yeah. never takes out the garbage. There's, there's going to be exceptions to every single rule. Yeah. So we try not to speak in absolutes either. The words I, ever and, and never and always are kind of like stop words. Yeah. And that also makes me think about, you know, we, I think that's something that we still struggle with a lot is those absolutes, especially when we're either having a disagreement or um, want the other person to maybe work on some sort of behavior, we tend to both use always and never a little yeah. too much. And I think that's also very detrimental to the, to the relationship in the grand scheme of it. If it's, a, if it's something that you're always doing, but mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go with the absolute always, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I love what you just did there because you, what you did was take accountability, which is the opposite of defensiveness by saying, oh, you know, we do this thing and we're working on it. Mm -hmm. So that's perfect. That's like the, you, you just modeled the very thing, you know, we're all trying to work on is how do you mm -hmm. admit that something's hard so that you can improve it? Yeah. Um, another thing that I'm sure a lot of couples struggle with is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can only specifically speak for, for our relationship, but, you know, I, I've also been in other relationships where it's been an issue where, you know, I might be, I, I'm a very uh, sensitive and emotional person and I am very easily vulnerable with people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think maybe to a point where it's not welcome because mm -hmm. I could have just met somebody and I'm telling them my life story <laughs> and <laughs> Boyfi's exactly kind of I could totally okay relate. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and Boyfi's more of the the I don't know more reserved in that sense and that's been something you know there were times in our early in our relationship where I felt like I was dragging emotions out of him like tell me how you feel <laughs> yeah. and on his side of it I was just like non-stop I feel this, I feel this, I feel this, I feel yeah, this, <laughs> yeah. which was also too much for him. And so I'm wondering if you have advice for anybody who might experience the same thing on how to find a balance between that, how to not only be vulnerable with your partner, but also to realize when is the right time to be vulnerable and mm -hmm. when is maybe not the right time. Right. That is such a great question. And I think that especially now, 
people are doing this thing where they're trying to be close because they've read a lot about attachment theory and they understand vulnerability leads to intimacy, which it does, <laughs> but it, it requires moving very gently into the self-disclosure to test the water. You can't just go on your own. It's impossible to be vulnerable. Well, we can be vulnerable on our own, but it's not wise. What, mm -hmm. what makes more sense is to give somebody a little bit of a, a thing about yourself and then make space for them to see how that lands and how comfortable they are with that amount of emotional expression because everybody ha everybody's on a different place in the continuum. So I recommend being a little bit vulnerable and seeing how your partner, you know, responds. Do they, do they also share something about themselves? Um, do they seem mm -hmm. a little bit like a deer in headlights and, and maybe you want to kind of back up a little bit so that it's a dance and this might be on a couple's first date or it could be 10 years in that we're constantly wanting to recognize where are you? And it could just be, where are you in this moment? Mm -hmm. Not that you're not that maybe your partner is perfectly comfortable with emotion, but they're cooking dinner and they're thinking about how they're, you know, they have to finish dinner by this time because they have a meeting at this time and, and it's not the right space maybe that they're able to hear you and talking about your feelings. So it's a setup for both partners because the person who's being vulnerable is going to feel sort of abandoned and maybe a little bit rejected a little bit hurt and the other person is is going to feel like wait well i do care about you and i want to hear what your feelings are and i want to be sitting down with you next to you and hearing it mm -hmm. so it sounds like the two of you are very aware of, of just what your comfort levels are in terms of emotions and it's not i mean i'm a therapist and i'm not going to say that everybody needs to be speaking their truth all the time there are times where i have a whole chapter in my book about like when do you bite your tongue when do you just let things slide mm -hmm. so that you can have fun together maybe your partner got on your nerves but they're already working on it they, they're they know they messed up does it make sense to have a have a conversation about it or does it make sense to just like uh be like Ugh. That was annoying, but I'd really love, like, we're about to go out, you know, and have breakfast together. And I would much rather be chatting about the movie that we saw last night or, mm -hmm. you know, how good the French toast is. That's that's a, a great point. We I think we learned a lot from getting to know each other and also getting to know the the boundaries and then also the, the phases in, on, during the day where, you know, we might be open to a conversation like that but then again also to let things slide I that 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 sounds it's so funny you when you said that I had all those images and the scenarios in the head where I saw myself like oh I could say something right now that maybe could lead to a fight but then but, but then I didn't because I was like what that's yeah, first of all it's not worth it and second I could just you know easily do it myself or just you know look over it and just mm -hmm. ignore it yeah um but getting back to the the being vulnerable part, um, I mean, I, I talked on the podcast before about why it was hard for me to be or why it sometimes is still hard for me to be vulnerable. And I don't want to go into that, but that, that would take too much time. But um, how, especially for men, I think, I mean, maybe in this day and age, it's getting easier for men to be vulnerable and be open about how they feel. But I, I bet a lot of men still struggle um, about the fact that they have this ingrained in their coming up and in their childhood that they are not allowed to, you know, cry and, and show their emotions. But is there a way maybe to be more open or is there like a little thing to be more open with your partner? Because I still sometimes, you know, it's on the tip of my tongue. I want to say something. I want to make myself heard and how I feel, but I just can't, you know, I can't get to that point where I actually voice myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're describing, I think, a process that's very, very familiar for people where it's, it's right at the tip of your tongue. And it's like, why is it scary to say this thing? And sometimes it's something positive. It's, it's vulnerable to say, I love you. 
just as much as it's vulnerable to say, you hurt my feelings last night. Um, and, and I think that part of that is what you're saying, which is being aware that, that it's, it's getting across the, that boundary of, I feel like I want to say something and I, it's, it's like right there and can I put it into words? And part of what you can do is kind of really look at your partner's expression. Are they looking at you with kindness and warm eyes? Are they available to you? And, and choosing that moment, if you see that I have somebody right across from me who really does love me and really does want to know how I feel, then you're getting that information in real time around I'm, I'm talking to my, my partner right now. I'm not talking to the person who maybe was critical of me or silenced me or told me that it wasn't, you know, masculine. And I, I don't think people say it's not masculine to talk about your feelings, but right. I, but it's umpteen different ways that you get that message directly, mm -hmm. indirectly, like it's reinforced. Um, so you have all of that to fight against and, and push, you know, push your comfort zone a little bit and test the waters with something small and see how your partner takes it. And if you're doing that thing that I recommend, which is taking your signals from your partner and they are giving the, you that warmth and, and the timing is right, they're not cooking dinner or they're not, or you're not in the middle of a fight, by the way. Like sometimes people, it's like they say their truth in anger mm -hmm. and it's so awkward because then it's like, both people kind of know, well, like, well, I do love you. And I was going to ask you to marry me, like in the middle of a fight or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's true. Because that's that momentum you're talking about of how do I get it, get it out. And when we're angry, there's more momentum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, so noticing the timing is my, my biggest advice. And, and to understand maybe a little bit more of whose voices are telling you that it's not safe. And that would be something that would take a little bit of time. Is there some message that I, that I don't agree with anymore as an adult that I did believe as a child? Or mm -hmm. is there a, a message from society that I don't necessarily have to buy into because I want more emotional connection and love with my partner? I want more mm -hmm. intimacy with my partner. And unfortunately, there's no other way. I wish I had another way besides vulnerability, but it really is what brings physical, emotional, and what I call intellectual intimacy, where you have that closeness that comes from being real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. I feel like we're getting like our own little therapy session right now. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Should send us your bill when we're done. <laughs> yeah, no, that was oh very, gosh. that was very nice. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was so insightful and, and, the thing is, sometimes you, you feel like you notice things already or they seem obvious, but hearing them from someone, first of all, from a professional makes such a huge difference. And then again, you know, getting it laid out like that, where it makes so much sense. I think it also normalizes it quite a bit, yeah. where when you hear it coming from somebody who's in your profession, who has so much experience with it, it also makes it feel so much more like these things that feel in your relationship as like they feel so big and they feel so like how can we ever do this or mm -hmm. are we ever going to get to the point where we can x or y and then you hear somebody in your profession talking about it and you think oh maybe it's not so it's not just us you know there there are so many people out there who are dealing with the exact same things and it's just it for me it just makes it feel more human it's more okay mm -hmm. this is just this is what we are. This is who we are as people. And these are the struggles that we have to work through. And yeah, I think working through them, I, I always feel like all of our struggles as human beings make us better people if you deal with them in the right way. So if you're proactive and if you're constructive about how you handle situations, that even if you make big mistakes, you can learn from them and end up being a better person for it. Yeah. Whereas if you don't do anything, then you might set yourself up for more issues or failure or things in the future. And I don't know, it, this whole thing just makes everything feel so There's this quote, normal. what is it? Um, if you stop changing, you stop living or something like that. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. I think that, I don't know, it, it might sound a little crass, but at the same point time, I believe that changing yourself and 
obviously growing is is something that you can put into your relationship because if you don't put in your work um you all the work that you two do together is is basically worth nothing because you have to be obviously um a foundation for yourself you have to be stable you have to be in order to to be with someone else and to keep that in order it's not it's not possible without to stay without feet knowing on yourself right, a little right. bit yeah, yeah. um right. but um my last question would be um how like we see we see a lot of um people you know live especially here in austria it's very it's still very um traditional traditional to be <laughs> married a long time and you don't get divorced because a lot of people are still very religious in that way where, you know, re uh, getting divorced is not what you do. But then seeing those couples being not happy together, mm -hmm. see, oh. like they, you see them and you feel like, okay, if you would get divorced and maybe, you know, um, they tried everything, you know, they tried everything and, and, and they just are not happy. And maybe is there something that we as younger couples can do to you know keep the spark up to be more happy to have a happy relationship absolutely and i do th i do want to rewind back a little bit to this idea of staying in a relationship when you're where you're unhappy and and of course you want to work to try to make it better and i agree with that and i agree with this concept i don't know if it's a new concept, but somebody used the expression like the grass is always greener where you water it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I love that. It's like you can if you want to be happy or you want your beautiful yard, like you have to weed it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I agree with that. But I also do think there is a time where you say, you know, these are my core values and needs and if i feel like i have to change my integrity mm -hmm. to stay in a relationship then you're giving up your soul you're giving yep. up your values then i'm not one of those people that's going to say you know stay together but i but no disrespect to people who do believe that and have religious beliefs behind that so i i just i feel that it's important to keep working on both making your relationship better, but also really being true to yourself. You know, mm -hmm. if if I'm your eighth therapist and you've worked with me for a year and a half and you're doing everything and, and it just feels like the, the changes that I'm encouraging you to make feel like giving up who you are, then it's a real soul soulful question mm -hmm. independently. Do I, do I want to keep doing that? So, uh, that's just my two cents. But getting back to how to how to be happier, I think that people forget that working on a relationship is also working on being happier. So much of it is about we need to communicate, we need to learn how to manage conflict. And it's like, yes, but are you having dates? Are you texting each other sweet little like flirty emojis with a winky face or a purple little heart emoji? I I am a huge fan of trying to inter um, intersect inter intersperse whatever the, that expression is you know periodically through the day just mm -hmm. letting your partner know hey i love you i think you're cute i you know i'm looking forward to this um time we're gonna you know eat breakfast together tomorrow so that you are spending more time increasing positivity than decreasing negativity so the most important and the majority of the time spent on a relationship is fun and interesting and having great dates and being creative about you know really low cost ways that you can just have romance and um and not waiting until you can afford some exotic mm -hmm. vacation mm -hmm. but like what are you doing on a tuesday night that you feel like you've got a sweetheart that is looking forward to seeing you if that makes sense mm -hmm. totally yeah it's so funny because those are things that you usually do like in the first you know span of a yeah. relationship that's so natural and then it, it, I wouldn't say dies down, but it you gets... You fall into routine. Right, you fall into routine and it gradually gets less, which is kind of sad because, I mean, obviously everybody loves to get things like that or everybody loves to hear things like that. So 
it's a it's a little small thing you can do. I mean, you like to leave little notes, and I yeah. love it. And Aww. I always think about it, but I never do it. <laughs> I should do it, but I, that's uh, that's one of my favorite things that he does. When if I do something sweet, or sometimes it's just like a random, like oh, I thought about doing this for you, but then I didn't. I'm like, well, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> I wish I could put. <laughs> I wish I could send you my thoughts, and you're like, oh, he thought doing that. That's nice. Yeah. No, I, I really should be more about, uh, behind doing those things. Yeah, um, maybe you would. Uh, quickly uh, tell us a little bit about your book um, that's coming out um, because I would love to hear more about it and then obviously maybe we can link all the information down in the description for people to get more information on. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So I have one book that's available right now, right away, and that's called Love is an Action Verb. And that is my attempt to put as much as I can, couples therapy, basically DIY, <laughs> okay. couples therapy for one. So something that one person can pick up, even if your partner is not maybe totally excited about self-growth, that a lot of times people get frustrated because maybe their partner doesn't want to read self-help and or maybe they, they want to go to therapy, but their partner doesn't. So what I tried to do is I put all of the stuff in the book that you can do on your own. So things mm -hmm. like communication skills, building positivity, not things like trauma and affair work. Like there's certain things that I really mm -hmm. don't believe you can just do on your own by reading a book. Mm -hmm. So what I tried to do is take those aspects and um, put it into a book. And my communication style is very non-jargony. So, so it is an evidence-based, all my advice is coming from lots of research but my approach tends to be it's a very quick read uh so some people might find my my language a little colloquial and they might not like it but other people who like that sort of flipping through and feeling mm -hmm. like you're just mm -hmm. talking to somebody that's kind of that the nature of that mm -hmm. and i'm super excited about this workbook because it's even more a sense of my whole hope is that what I, what you're saying about starting a little earlier, this whole people don't come in until they, they seven years later, like my hope is maybe they can buy a workbook, sit down and, and, and do it together. And uh, so what I do is I, in this workbook, I will, I'm guiding couples and having certain kinds of conversations that, I, that you would have in my office, but, but I'm asking you sort of fill out this questionnaire. And then it's a lot of interviews of like, ask your, ask your partner this question, and mm -hmm. then you flip flop. And then each one of you is, is learning new things or talking about, about things maybe you haven't talked about before. Mm, so, I like that. Uh, those are my books. And, yeah. and I have a bunch of free resources on my website, which is laurasilverstein.co. I, I have a date night planner. I have a conflict management e-course. I have an empathy training course. So I'm just trying to give away as much as I can for free for in the middle of this mental health crisis. And hopefully people can get some benefit. That's so awesome. That's I, great. Yeah. I con I, first of all, congratulations on the book and the work, but it sounds really cool. Thank and you. We'll link everything down in the description for people to check it out. And yeah, do you have anything else to add? I don't think so. This I I said already. I feel like this was like a little therapy session yeah, for us, I and agree. it was absolutely lovely and uh, really really nice to to meet you and, and get to know you a little bit. And yeah. Yeah, it was very yeah. I think one of my favorite podcasts so far. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Oh my yeah. gosh, that's so sweet. Thank yeah. you. I just want to say to you guys, I think it's amazing what you're doing because you're putting yourselves out there. What you were saying before about people knowing they're not alone, but you guys being like willing to go on a podcast, talk about these challenges in your relationship, you're showing real couples that they're not alone and maybe making it that much easier for them to start these conversations. So... Thanks for this work you're doing. I, I think it's Thank amazing. You. Thanks. Thank you. Like yeah. like we said before, I think before we started recording, but we had said we don't really edit things out of the podcast. And a yeah. big reason for that is because we want it to feel natural. We want it to feel like, hey, these are two people that make mistakes. These are two people that, you know, mess up their words or say the yep. wrong thing. Or sometimes we've argued on the podcast where we get upset with each other and we just leave it all in because it's, it's, it's just... Not, it's not that often. Though. It's not that often, but it happens. <laughs> You just reach out to me. I'll help you out. Yeah. <laughs> we just want to be as real as possible. Yeah. And I, like I said, I'm an open book, so I am willing to talk about basically anything. And I love just, that. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thanks so much. This is so fun. Thank I wish you. I could come meet you now in Austria. Yeah. Anytime. Yeah, we have a lot of snow right now, so <laughs> skiing do. is on right now. <laughs> oh, I, I haven't gone skiing since high school. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow, indeed. I mean, listen back to our intro. We were super excited, and I'm still very excited. So, <laughs> yeah, easily one of my favorite episodes so far. Yeah. Yeah. But we're also just total suckers for anything that's like couples therapy related because I think so much so because we've not only done couples therapy ourselves and have actually implemented a lot of these things and seen that they work. The fruit of our so labor. Like, yes, exactly. <laughs> we've seen firsthand that these things work. So it's not just like this person says it works and we're not really sure. But no, like they do. It actually yeah. works. Yeah, they do. And I think also just because we started as a relationship podcast, yep. we we have a soft spot for stuff like that. So yep. it's definitely a lovely, lovely um, talk with her. Yeah. As I said, all the information is down in the description. And if you, you know, want to contact you know. her, feel free. <laughs> and if you like what you hear, as always, like, subscribe, rate, rate. And review the podcast, share the podcast, that helps a lot. And if you want to help us out more, you can, you know, look up, out, look up. Look up. <laughs> you can, you oh, can wow. look up. That was a bad call for action. <laughs> look up our Patreon. Yeah. Or just look up. Like, look up. No. I mean, watch the movie Look Up on Netflix, but, you know. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Woo!